good morning and welcome to everyone here in church and those of you who are in Zoom. I hope you've had a good week with this uh, <clears throat> lovely sunshine, which was such a tonic. Um, just a reminder of the service of the Thanksgiving for the life of Roy Smith at Crowthorne Methodist Church next Saturday at 2.30. If you'd like to attend <clears throat> this service, please let them know as the church are still observing the social distancing. So number attend attendance has to be limited. All the information and contacts, contact numbers are to be found in the church notices. And um, it is my pleasure to welcome Kim, Kim Tain, who's come again to lead us in our worship. Welcome to Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Good morning. morning. And how many people do we have on Zoom this morning? Um, well, six, oh, good morning to everyone on Zoom as well. And anyone who's catching up later on YouTube, good whatever to you. <laughs> <laughs> Our call to worship is from Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Therefore, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to the Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Let's sing our first hymn, which is number 83. In singing the faith, praise my soul, the King of heaven.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather before you. Glad of your presence with us all our lives. Before we could know anything about you, you knew us. Before we could do anything for you, you called us. We're glad of your presence in the world. Even before there were human beings, your plan for the earth was in progress. And we have hope that your plan for this world will come to fruition and that each of us has a part to play. We thank you that you made human beings in your image and with your help, we recognize your work in us and in each other. We know that we often miss the mark. We often have the best of intentions and the highest of ideals and then fail to live up to them. But we thank you that every day you call us anew. And as you call us, you equip us with the gifts of your spirit. And so we pray this morning that you will open our eyes to see what you're doing around us and open our ears and open our imaginations so that we can see and hear and hope in your work around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. A bit about shortcuts. I like shortcuts. I like anything that saves me time and effort. It's because I'm busy. What do I mean lazy? I'm not quite sure. But I'm so old, I learned to touch type in school. Did anyone else do that? Touch typing. So useful. I've used it nearly every day since. And I learned to type on a manual typewriter. Anybody remember those? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. And if you made a mistake, do you remember those little strips of paper, the Tipex strips? You, you could just tuck in beside the ribbon and you had to backspace and do that letter again and almost an invisible correction. And then I remember when the latest technology was the electric typewriter with the correcting ribbon built into it, which made it a little bit easier. A bit fiddly if you also needed a perfect carbon copy though, wasn't it? Okay, that's lost all the young folks now. <laughs> Get your grandparents to explain. Isn't it so much easier now on a computer? You can correct your mistakes. You can rephrase a whole paragraph or a whole page so easily. A bit of backspacing or just a bit of selecting and deleting and it's gone. You can have another go as many times as you like. So, I do like that. I like anything that saves me work. So I love all the features you get with Microsoft Word. I like you can put in a table of contents and keep updating it. 
You can cut and copy and paste and all the rest. You can mail merge, you do a whole load of letters so, so quickly. I was sad to read this week that a man called Larry Tesla, who invented some of the computer shortcuts like copy and paste and cut, died this week at the age of 72. He saved me so much time. And I was a bit sad that it was only this week that I learned his name of that man who saved me so much time. Now, if only there was a shortcut to being a better Christian, I would like one of those as well. Now, I do like the phrase practicing Christian. That, that does imply that we're not quite there yet, doesn't it? We have to keep practicing um, because we've, we've still got some work to do. But maybe I did find an answer. Maybe there is a way to be instantly godly. Here it is. I have to take my glasses off because the print's a bit small. But what it says on this little can, it says divine. Prepare to become a goddess with my senses divine and exotically oriental perfume with highlights of sweet rose and mellow toffee to captivate with passion. Embrace the divine scent by spraying all over the body and wait for the wondrous results. <laughs> this is amazing. And I don't know if you can see the prestigious brand of this miraculous perfume. Can, you, can anyone see that? No, it's Tesco's. <laughs> This is amazing. The answer is from Tesco's Divine. Actually, it's not gonna work, is it? <laughs> what a claim to make from Tesco's. And I, I think these cost about 70p if you go and do your shopping. So we're going to be thinking a bit more about being the best that we can be. A bit about that process of becoming godly or better Christians or however we want to phrase that. Unfortunately, without any shortcuts. Let's sing our next hymn, which is number 116 in Singing the Faith. Sing for God's glory that colors the dawn of creation.
Thank you, Dave. Reading these readings yesterday, and I would try to work out what uh, King's sermon is going to be about. I'm not quite, still not quite sure because. <laughs> it's okay, neither am I. <laughs> there's no shortcut to me. Um, Old Testament reading is from Numbers 11, reading verses 4 to 6, and then from verse 10, which is on page 141. Quail from the Lord. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. Never see anything of this manna. And from verse 10, Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. The Lord became ex exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you, that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me right now. If I have found, if I have found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. The Lord, said, the Lord said to Moses, bring 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Make them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the power of a spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. And then from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, reading from verse 42, you'll find it on page 958. Causing to stumble. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who do, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. 
if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you, ent for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and to be thrown into a hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, lock it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into a hell where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Well, the, the theme that sort of ties the two readings together and that the theme I'm going to be thinking about today is shortcuts versus a long work in progress. Maybe there isn't actually a perfume that can change your character or really much else about you other than the way you smell. Life is a long work of progress, isn't it? Longer for some than others, of course. The task in front of Moses in that reading is, is to get that bunch of people to the promised land. And we find him at a point where it's not really looking too promising. He's got the slaves out of Egypt. And maybe that, once that part was behind, he thought, well, that's the difficult bit over. Now, now we're free. Um, we've, we've done that first bit. We've done the facing up to Pharaoh. We've, we've been through the 10 plagues, crossing the Red Sea, and all that seems so difficult. But now they're in the desert and they want food. So now what? And perhaps anyone who's ever managed a team of people can understand how Moses is feeling at this point when he's worked really hard and been through so much, doing his absolute best, and the people on the team are, are just whinging and moaning. And um, that there are nods. Some of you have been through this. You, you share my pain, and we, we share the pain of Moses here. And Moses needs help. He's expressing really serious stress in this passage. And what would he have given for an instant answer if God had said, here, Moses, just take the spray <laughs> and everything will get better? What, what would he have given for a, an easy answer like that to make everybody suddenly cooperative and well-behaved and working together? So let's... Um, Let's read on a little bit for what God told Moses to do. He said, gather 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. I will come down and talk with you and I will take some of the spirit that's on you and put it on them and they shall bear the burden of the people along with you so that you will not bear it all by yourself. And probably most managers would welcome 70 extra assistant managers to try and to be a buffer between them and all that whinging and moaning. So he can do this, this bit of delegating 70 people who would take on the mentoring and the coaching and the disciplining and the reassuring and instructing and all the other stuff that a leader has to do and try and get those people working more positively. The aim, I don't know if it would ever accomplished, the aim would be to get those people to be the best group of people that they can be, the best community that they can be, because they've got to form a nation. They're not that rabble of slaves anymore. There was a time when I was working in an events team and we, we put on event after event. And after 
every event, no matter how well it went, um, we would sit and discuss afterwards what went well, what didn't go so well, what could we change next time and make it even better. And as we progressed over a few years, we found that after every event, no matter how well it had gone, there were always new ideas for improving, or there was a, a new problem popped up that we had to have a solution for. And we saw our standards every year step up and up and up. And that was a really good feeling, working in that team and seeing the improvements that we, we were doing. Of course, things went wrong sometimes, and we had to deal with it. But uh, I remember a very happy three or so years working in that team. We have to start from where we are, even if it looks really unpromising. And we have to have the desire for that stepping up and improvement. We have to have the motivation. And that can be quite tricky, can't it? Especially if you have a team where some people are more motivated and other people are just not. As the saying goes, you can take the slaves out of Egypt. It's going to take a lot longer to get Egypt out of the slaves. And then from Jesus, we, had, we heard some of the, the hard sayings of Jesus. There are easy sayings of Jesus that it's lovely to preach about because they're lovely to say and lovely to hear. It's lovely to preach that God loves us. And of course, that's true. It's the basis and the foundation of our whole relationship with God. And calling God our father puts that love in a context. It puts it in a family context where children are loved but they still need encouraging sometimes to behave well, to have good manners, to do their work in school, do their chores around the house, whatever. They can be loved absolutely, but perhaps any parent has sometimes wished that their children would behave better or stop whinging for five minutes. Jesus didn't just say easy things. He said very difficult things sometimes, like take up your cross and follow me, like love your enemies. That's really difficult, isn't it? Bless those who persecute you. Forgive those who wrong you. Some people are really tested on each of those points. How about where it said that we're not even to think wrong thoughts? And here, if your right eye offends you, cut it out and throw it away. Isn't that a bit drastic? This isn't Christianity for dummies here, is it? It's, this is faith for grown-ups who want to take their faith and their life in Christ seriously. Does it really mean we should start cutting off body parts? I, I think probably not, because if we think about it, we'll realize that it's not our hands or our eyes or our feet that cause us to stumble. It's something going on in here. It's our thoughts and our emotions and our motivations. So perhaps we should read this as exaggeration. Hyperbole is the posh word the scholars sometimes use exaggeration to make a strong point. Do we really pay enough attention to cutting out aspects of our lives that might not be helpful to walking with God? For that, we need some self-awareness and a bit of self-examination. The New Testament often uses a word for sin that, that is quite gentle, the word hamartia, it comes from archery, and it means missing the mark. So if you imagine somebody really doing their best, putting in the work, putting in the training, aiming for that bullseye, but missing. So there's an implication there that, that you tried, 
but you didn't quite get there. But the word used in, in this passage, it's uh, translated here in the RSV as if you put a stumbling block before little ones who believe in me, if your foot causes you to stumble, if your hand, eye, etc., causes you to stumble, that's, a, that's not hamartia, that's a different word. That's scandalizo, which can be translated as giving offence or to trap or snare. And Jesus is pointing out that the consequences of doing something wrong can be quite monumental and causing somebody else to stumble or be trapped or be snared. There's probably more of a sense there of doing something deliberately, not that you tried to do the right thing and missed, but something deliberate. And we are probably more and more aware these days of how causing harm to a little one can cast a shadow over the rest of their lives. And so that image of the millstone around somebody's neck, that's quite a frightening image, isn't it? It's a serious image. And judgment isn't really something that we think a lot about these days, is it? We, we prefer the, the message that God loves us. I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said, children love justice because they are innocent. Adults love mercy because they know they're guilty. But one day, everyone will be face to face with God and accountable for what they've done. We speak even less about hell. The Hebrew Bible speaks about Sheol, which is quite a simple concept. It's simply the place of the dead, the grave, and it's a neutral place. There's, there's no judgment or anything to fear other than that, that process of, of dying. But in this passage, where Jesus speaks of the unquenchable fire and the worm that never dies, Jesus is speaking of Gehenna, which in his day was an actual place. It was a valley outside of Jerusalem, and it was a place that inspired fear and dread and horror. It was where the city rubbish dump was. There were always fires burning there. It was always crawling with maggots. And it was a place with really nasty associations, partly because it was where the, the bodies of executed criminals would be dumped. So to end up there was indeed a terrible thing and a terrible fate. It's where the bodies of the criminals crucified with Jesus, it's where they would have ended up. It's where Jesus would have ended up if Joseph of Arimathea hadn't intervened. So this is a serious thought in this passage. Do something drastic to keep yourself on the straight and narrow because that's better than to end up being burnt with the rubbish. So is hell then a literal place? I'm not so sure of that. Many parts of the church have believed in hell as a, a literal place where people go and are consciously, eternally tormented for their sins. But Revelation describes a time when both death and hell will be thrown into the lake of fire and destroyed. That's obviously symbolic language, perhaps indicating that if there is a hell, it doesn't last forever, it will be destroyed. But I do know that there are people living in hell right now, in situations that could be described as hell. There are people living through war and conflict and abuse and trauma of all kinds. There are people who can't help but create hell for themselves because of what has damaged them. 
and who create hell for other people. So maybe Jesus is saying it's better to be ruthless with yourself, to cut something out of your life, rather than risk creating hell for yourself or for other people. That is something I think our culture doesn't really help us with because we're in a, a culture where it's funny to behave badly or outrageously. And it's cool to prove that you're clever by doing something stupid. Or at least it, it, it was when I was young. I'll assume that all young people now know much better than we did back in the 70s. I'll, I'll take a, a small example. I, I knew a man who was like a lot of young men. He liked to go out with his mates and his group of mates liked to go to the pub and have a lot to drink. At some point, this man wanted to stop and he had a decision to make. He realized that going out drinking every night was bad for him because he was waking up every morning feeling ill and hungover. And he knew he was spending way too much money at the pub. But his mates wanted to carry on as they were. So he had to decide. And the drastic thing that he did was give up most of his friends. He gave up most of the people he liked the most and stopped going out with them. He doesn't regret it. He realized very quickly the benefits of feeling well again, physically. And then when he worked out how much money he was saving, well, that just clinched it. I knew someone who gave up a job that he loved. He, he was an accountant and he left because he was asked to do something he felt was unethical. He struggled to find another job and he had to take one at a much lower salary. And he doesn't regret it. He said he couldn't live with himself with what he was being asked to do. And he said he couldn't have slept at night. God calls us to grow and, and to be the best that we can be. But how do we do that? How do we align ourselves with, with God's will and work towards that being the best that we can be. Well, there's no shortcut. There's no quick spray, no quick fix. And a, a woman I, I used to know who was the mother of four teenagers and, and three of her teenagers had been adopted as teenagers and came to her with some quite significant emotional problems. She once said to me, I believe I have the gift of patience, but I can't take it for granted. I have to pray for it every day and then it comes. And it seems to be that day by day, seeking God's will. There's a way of praying that some people find very helpful. It's from the writings of Saint Ignatius. And there's a way of praying called the examen. And it actually sounds rather like the meetings that we used to have at work after an event when we thought about what didn't go well and what did go well and what should we change. Praying the examen is simply thinking about your day and reflecting on it thanking God for the blessings, asking forgiveness for what you could have done better and asking help for the future. We don't get instant results. It would be lovely if there was a control X, control V on life. We can just replace the bits that we, we don't like. But day by day for the rest of our lives, like that mother, praying for patience every day. Wherever we are in life, we're still a work in progress, but God is leading us to be that person that God intends us to be and to be the group of people that, that God intends us to be. So let's sing our next hymn, which is number 660, 
in singing the faith, called by Christ to be disciples. Our prayers of intercession, let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you love us exactly as we are. And that you call us to be the best that we can be. We thank you for the work you have begun in us. Help us to cooperate with your will and become the individuals and the group of people you want us to be. We pray for people and situations that seem such a long way from your values. We pray for the people living in the middle of conflict especially at the moment in Afghanistan. We pray for the many Muslims who do not support the Taliban and pray that you'll give them hope and courage to find solutions for their country. We pray for people living in a personal hell in situations of abuse or bullying, and especially those who are tempted towards self-destructive ways of coping. Lord, give them strength to find a way out of their situation and to find people who will help them and build them up and support them.
We pray for the people of our own community in and around Bracknell. For everyone who calls themselves Christian. And for those of other faiths and for those who don't yet know what to call themselves. Help us to be the best community that we can be, working together for common good. We pray for those with anxiety and stress. For managers who need to follow the example of Moses and delegate something. for people who need to learn to do something more positive than moaning, for people who need to make hard decisions. We ask you to guide their reasoning and bring them to the best decision that they can make. We pray for our lorry drivers and bin men and delivery people. Thank you for what they do, often unnoticed and taken for granted. We pray that you'll bless them and prosper them. And we pray for our church in Bracknell. Thank you for everyone who's come to church this morning and for everyone joining in at home. Help us to be the best that we can be, supportive to each other, open and welcoming. We thank you, Lord, that in your mercy you hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. The final hymn is number 526. Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy.
Shall we close by saying the grace to each other? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.